Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Several members have filed parliamentary questions on the certificate of entitlement. And my ministerial statement will address questions 1 to 7 for oral answer, as well as question 25 for written answer in today's order paper, as well as related questions that have been filed for subsequent sittings. So I will preface my reply to members' questions with an overview of our land transport system. To be complete, any discussion on COEs must be situated within the broader context of our land transport system, of which private cars are but one aspect. So to meet the transport needs of Singaporeans and enhance our living environment, we must address two key constraints, land and carbon emissions. <clears throat> Roads occupy 12% of our land, compared to around 13% for industry and 15% for housing. Our land transport system accounts for about 15% of Singapore's total domestic carbon emissions. We must make it much more sustainable as part of the national effort to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Pre-COVID, about 14 million journeys were made every day across four modes, public transport, point-to-point -point transport, private vehicles, and active mobility. So that is the scale of the challenge. The government's aim is to build an accessible, inclusive, and sustainable land transport system that meets the needs of all Singaporeans. The best way to achieve this is through mass public transport. It allows the greatest number of people to get to their destinations with the least land take and carbon emissions. Our rail network serves around 3 million journeys a day, and it takes up less than 1% of our total surface area. In contrast, roads take up 12% of our land for 7 million journeys. This includes those made by cars, motorcycles, buses, as well as PHCs. Compared to driving an internal combustion engine car, taking the train reduces our carbon footprint by 90%. That is why public transport, mass public transport, is the core of our transport strategy. And our rail network is the backbone of our transport system. Today, seven in 10 households are within a 10-minute walk of one of our 202 MRT and LRT stations. By the next decade, it will be eight in 10 households. To achieve this, we are building an additional 100 kilometers of rail, almost a 40% increase from our current rail network. By 2035, we will have eight MRT lines and two LRT lines interconnected and reaching all parts of the island. As we expand our public transport network, we are also ensuring that it is inclusive, affordable, and sustainable. Today, all our MRT stations and bus interchanges, as well as 98% of our bus stops are barrier free, and the work is ongoing. Public transport, as we have discussed many times in this house, is heavily subsidized. And our public transport fleet will fully comprise cleaner energy models by 2040. We are also improving first mile, last mile connectivity with extensive infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians. By 2030, the island-wide cycling path network will more than double to about 1,300 kilometers. Through LTA's Friendly Streets initiative, we will work with the local communities to create more pedestrian-friendly facilities within residential neighborhoods. <clears throat> more broadly, LTA and fellow government agencies are integrating land transport and urban planning strategies. 
to enhance the livability of our city by bringing jobs closer to homes, developing lifestyle and amenity hubs near transport nodes, and making public transport and active mobility convenient for the daily commute. Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, given the land and carbon constraints I have highlighted, going car light is a key strategy that our agencies have adopted. With excellent public transport connectivity and active mobility infrastructure, less road and parking spaces are needed for general vehicular traffic. This is the car light future that we envisage as we plan and redevelop our precincts to prioritize pedestrians, cyclists, and public transport users and lessen the need for and use of private cars. Even amongst cars, there is a spectrum of choices. Shared transport, which includes both taxis and private hire cars, or PHCs, providing point-to-point -point passenger transport services, complements mass public transport. They provide a useful alternative to car ownership for those who may need access to car-like services, whether chauffeured or self-driving. Today, the P2P sector accounts for 1 million daily journeys, up from 800,000 in 2012. With zero growth in our car population, such shared transport, including car sharing services, allow for a more efficient and inclusive use of our roads, serving the needs of many more Singaporeans as compared to individually owned private cars. The total PHC population has averaged around 70,000 since 2019 with some fluctuations due to COVID-19 and the subsequent reopening of Singapore's economy. As a proportion of the total car population, PHEs have remained at around 10% the past four years. In fact, the period when we saw the fastest growth in PHC numbers was between 2015 to 2017 when it increased from 30,000 to almost 70,000. There was no commensurate upward pressure on COE prices in that period. Conversely, while COE prices have been rising over the past several quarters, demand from PHC companies has in fact been moderating. PHCs are a flexible way to augment the supply of point-to-point -point passenger transport, giving commuters more choices while serving a much wider segment of society than private cars. So we should be careful when making calls about imposing caps, sometimes arbitrary, on the PHC population. That said, the PHCs are a relatively new development. The P2P regulatory framework, for example, only commenced in 2017. And COVID-19 has also caused some disruption in the market. So we are studying this further to ascertain the effect of PHCs and whether or if there is, in fact, any impact on the market. On private car ownership, there are encouraging trends, especially among our youth. According to a Straits Times survey, the percentage of youth who aspire to own a car has fallen from around 65% in 2016 to around 50% in 2022. More than 75% of the respondents cited ready access to public transport as the reason why they did not aspire to own a car. Nevertheless, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, we do recognize that there is still a desire to own a car for some it is a necessity, for others a useful option, yet others an aspiration. Hence, it's quite understandable that members have raised questions on the COEs and prices. COEs 
are a key feature of our vehicle quota system. The VQS is essential for us to achieve our zero growth rate policy objective for cars and motorcycles. It is the principal tool to manage ownership, as recognized in the 1996 white paper on creating a world-class land transport system. The vehicle quota system fundamentally works through supply and demand forces to efficiently allocate a scarce resource, COEs. The system also incorporates progressivity considerations by having different COE categories. In fact, when the COE system first started in 1990, there were four categories for cars. The number of categories was reduced to the current two in 1999 to address concerns over the relatively small quota supply and resultant volatility, as well as limited choices of cars in some categories. Category E, which is the open category, was retained to allow for changing preferences and needs in vehicle types over time. Mr. Liang ying has asked if there are plans to review the COE system. On the whole, the system continues to serve our policy objective of efficiently allocating the limited supply of COEs. However, over the years, the Ministry of Transport and the Land Transport Authority have made various refinements to the VQS system to ensure its relevance and efficacy without forsaking the core policy intent. The power rating criterion of 97 kilowatts was introduced in 2014 for the mass market Cat A so that car COE categories are differentiated not just by engine capacity. Last year, as more electric car models became available in Singapore, we increased the power output threshold for Cat A COEs to 110 kilowatt hour in order to accommodate mass market electric cars. On Mr. Liang, Liang Man Wai's question, between 2018 and April this year, the median open market value or OMV for Cat A cars for each year was just over half of the median OMV for Cat B cars in the same year. So in other words, if I can put it the other way, Cat B OMVs in the median is about 75% higher compared to the median in Cat A. So there is a clear differentiation although it may not be a complete dichotomization of the market. And we will continue to monitor and review the differentiating criteria between categories A and B as the technology evolves. <clears throat> Ms. Mariam Jafar and Mr. Saktiandi Supat asked about CAT DCOEs for motorcycles. A key feature of the motorcycle market is that dealers bid and hold the Temporary Certificates of Entitlement, or TCOEs, in their own name before transferring it to a motorcycle buyer. This is a deliberate design feature because it provides convenience for buyers who can readily purchase a motorcycle. This is unlike the car market where bids are primarily in the name of the buyer. The prospective car buyers who need immediate access to a car, in other words, a bid was not submitted in their name, can rely on CAT E COEs, where there's some flexibility. As I explained at my ministry's committee of supply debate this year, about 450 CAT D temporary COEs that were secured when prices were close to or above $13,000 were subsequently left to expire when COE prices fell. To Ms. Mariam Jaffa's query, the expired TCOEs were held by more than 50 dealers. 
And of course, those with a bigger market share contributed more. But there is a spread. The TCOE utilization rate subsequently went back up with the market correcting when you could not support the prevailing prices. And this is what we mean by the market working as intended. In other words, it responds to price signals upwards or downwards, and then there is a reallocation. Nevertheless, to improve allocative efficiency and deter any speculative bidding, we made further moves recently to increase the bid deposit from $800 to $1,500 and to shorten the TCOE validity period from three months to one month. Let me now address some of the specific questions raised by various members about car COE prices. Dr. Lim Wee Kiak and Ms. Joan Pereira asked about the impact of foreigners. And I know this is a common query. The proportion of car COE secured by foreigners remains low and it has not changed significantly over the years. As I shared in January this year, from July 2020 to December 2022, on average, less than 3% of car COEs were allocated to foreigners. And this number has remained stable. Another common query, there's no specific PQ on this, but I know it's on many members' minds and elsewhere. Another common query is about multiple car owning households. In November last year, I had shared with this house that as of 31st October 2022, of the 471,000 households that own cars, and that's about 36% of all households in Singapore. So of that 471,000 households, 12% own two cars, and less than 3% own three or more cars. And the percentage just remain about the same today. And in fact, over the past decade, the proportion of a multiple car owning households has been steadily declining from about 19% of households in 2012 to less than 15% today. I had also, in a response to a PQ, I think, earlier in the year by Mr. Gerald Giam, pointed out, and it is worth noting and underscoring, that these multiple car-owning households reside not just in private residential estates, but also in public housing, including some households that own three or more cars. Mr. Saktiandi Supar asked about the effect of car shows and promotions. As the member would be well aware, consumers make their purchasing decisions based on a myriad of factors. So it is actually quite difficult to establish a causal relationship between such car shows and promotions with COE prices. So what then is the cause of rising COE prices? Fundamentally, the COE prices reflect demand for a limited supply of COEs. And this is further accentuated or exacerbated by the fact that we are now at a trough in the 10-year cycle of COE supply. Demand in all categories has remained resilient, especially as the economy recovers from post-COVID-19. And incomes have also been rising over the long term. As was observed in Professor Raymond Ong's article in the Straits Times on the 7th of May, the ratio of COE prices to median monthly household income has fallen from 11 to 1 during the previous COE price peak in 2013 to 9 is to 1 today. So in comparison to median income, the COE price is actually lower. Although in absolute terms, the price has risen. And the reason is because household incomes have risen. 
As household incomes continue to rise in the coming years, coupled with our policy of zero growth in car population, we must expect the long-term trajectory for COE prices to be upwards. COE supply, in turn, is determined primarily by car deregistrations in preceding quarters, which has been relatively low of late. Over the past few months, the Ministry of Transport has made several moves to reduce volatility in quota supply. Instead of just the preceding quarter, we first adopted the average of the preceding two quarters in August last year and now use the moving average of deregistrations in the four preceding quarters to compute COE quotas for the next quarter. These moves have helped to mitigate quarter-on-quarter -quarter volatility. We also expect the COE supply to start increasing substantially in the coming months as more cars reach the 10-year mark. Notwithstanding this, MOT and LTA have studied if there's more that we can do to smoothen the supply of COEs in categories A and B, while adhering, importantly, to the cap on the overall car population over the 10-year cycle. Consequently, as a one-off exercise, LTA will bring forward and redistribute the supply from five-year COEs, which are due to expire in the next projected supply peak. As these five-year COEs cannot be extended and therefore have to be deregistered, LTA will be able to identify the exact number with certainty. This supply will be redistributed over several quarters starting from the next bidding exercise. This move will increase quota supply in the next bidding exercise by about 24% in CAT A and 15% in CAT B. LTA will release more details shortly. Even as we make this move, I would like to emphasize two points. First, this will help to lessen, but it will not eliminate volatility in supply. There will still be a degree of supply fluctuation due to historical factors and also broader market conditions. Secondly, the long-term upward trend of COE prices due to rising incomes and zero vehicle population growth will not abate. So Deputy Speaker, sir, as we seek to improve the efficiency of the COE system, with these measures that have been already undertaken over the years, it is important that we do not lose sight of our goal of becoming a car light society with accessible and inclusive transport for all Singaporeans. The COE system helps us to make our transport system more sustainable and our living environment better for all. As Singapore develops and grows, Singaporeans' transport needs will continue to evolve, and our transport policies must move in tandem while paying heed to our key constraints. The government is committed to developing the necessary policies and infrastructure to build a car light, accessible, inclusive, and sustainable transport system to meet the diverse needs of Singaporeans. It is part of our social compact anchored by the values we hold as a society. Ultimately, our success in realizing that vision rests in the commuting choices that every Singaporean makes every day. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister um, for this statement. Um, I would like to suggest in terms of uh, two suggestions to the current COE system, and this is not new. This was suggested previously before. First is, of course, will the, will the MOT consider a pay-as-you-bid system instead of people bidding higher and then paying for the, lower, low, the, 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 the low, lowest rate? And second is that whether can we make COE uh, system as, this allowed financing of COE? 
which means that when you take a loan itself, it has to only be the car loan and not the COE. The COE has to be paid by cash. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if there's one thing I've learned uh, in my short time in the Ministry of Transport, there's no shortage of creativity in the suggestions made to improve the COE system, and I thank the member for his uh, suggestions. But if I may say, first, a pay-as-you-bid system, I understand the motivation behind it, but uh, if I may offer you the counter counterpoint, the problem then is you create a great deal of variation in the market. For the same car bought in the same exercise, the value may be quite different because one bit higher and one bit lower. Also, and I don't want to get into a long discussion on this, but from an auction theory perspective and so on, actually the method we use is probably the most efficient. So I would say that, uh, you know, we should just, th that is not the source of the problem. So let's diagnose this correctly. The issue is not the system or how it is being administered per se. The, system, the issue is really around supply and some level of volatility that we are trying to mitigate. As well, where we can or where we discern, some need to intervene because of either speculation or some inefficiencies in the market. And that's what we have sought to do. The second point on financing, I would say, um, I think it's a question that should be put to MAS, frankly, but, uh, or the authorities, but if I may just offer you uh, this perspective. A COE and the car are indivisible, really. A, a standalone COE is of little value until it's applied to register a car. So one needs to look at it in totality first. Second, if you look at it from the point of view of the cost of buying a car, which then you're seeking to finance, I think most financial institutions will look at it as a whole. The value of the car, the, the market price, including the COE price. So that's why the system runs as it is. And again, I want to go back to the point that I'm not sure that decoupling the financing is going to be the solution to the current set of concerns that members have. Mr. Pratam Singh. Sorry, I thought it was... Uh your hand. Uh, Mr. Liang Ying-Hua. <laughs> Hands look uh, similar uh, from here. <laughs> a privilege to sit next my to you. My apologies. You get to see the hands. Um, well, my first question to the minister is, uh, I mean, you mentioned that the, the, the reason why the COE prices are high is because of high demand and the limited supply. But I would like to ask the minister whether another reason why the COE prices may be at this level, this recent wave, is because the, the disparity in the purchasing power among the bidders now. Uh, in other words, there are, in each batch of the COE bidding, there are more bidders that have higher purchasing power and therefore able to pay up. And that's where the, where the COE prices is. So I'd like to ask whether is that desirable? Uh, and second is whether, uh, whether the minister, I want to ask the minister whether uh, some, form, uh, some amount of uh, allocation by balloting, uh, like how we do for housing, can be part of the solution as well. Thank Mr. Liang for his uh, questions. I'm not sure what uh, the member means by disparity in purchasing power. Because as I explained earlier, overall, if you look at it over a 10-year cycle, peak to peak, our incomes have risen. And to the extent that cars remain an aspirational or a necessity, an aspirational product or a necessity, then you must express, expect that there will be a propensity to want to allocate budget to buy that. And it will be, the prices will reflect to some extent the trends in incomes as well. That's why I gave the numbers that I did. That is not to say that, you know, that is the only factor, but the general rise, if you compare it to incomes rising and so on, I think that does tell us an important story. Secondly, I would say that in terms of ownership, I stress this point and I would like to make it again. We have 470,000 households in Singapore that own cars. That's about 36, 37%. So it's a very sizable proportion of our population base. And so I think what we have been trying to do is through a combination of ownership and usage measures, make cars available as widely as possible 
but within our zero growth constraint, which we have imposed for good reasons. And that will continue to be the basis. Your second point was on balloting. Uh, balloting some amount. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm very sure all the members here will be able to offer perspectives on it, but let me just uh, deal with this. If we say a proportion of COEs are balloted and the rest are not, then the question is, um, so we have a market where you bid and you secure, and then there's another segment which is by luck of the draw, literally. How do we price that? Do you price it at the same price as the COE in that period? Or do you say, no, it's a discounted price? If it's a discounted price, then it's a windfall for the party that gets this because they will then be able to resell the car with the COE at a higher price because the market clearing price is higher. Then the question is, what justifies such a ballot? Who qualifies and how do we do it? I'm just sharing this with members because I appreciate the intent behind the suggestion, but I'm trying to point out that there are several quite intractable second and third order issues we'll have to deal with. And we will very quickly move from discussing COE prices to wondering why the balloting system is not working. And indeed, uh, we do have discussions like that in this house as well. So a balloting system is not a panacea. And in fact, it may aggravate the problems uh, if, if the concern is around price and unevenness in the market. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I have two clarifications. One is in relation to the COE, whether the Ministry has conducted any public surveys to better understand and aim at discovering what are the factors that would actually persuade more private vehicle owners to switch to public transport. Another one is in an effort to reduce carbon footprint. Um, what is the current ratio of the double to single to double decker buses currently in service, um, and whether LTA has plans to move towards 100% double decker to maximise um, the ridership capacity and thereby an effort to reduce the carbon footprint? Uh, factors that will persuade uh, car owners to switch, uh, I think there are several. Uh, I've talked about some of them. The most important thing that we need to do is populate the spectrum of commuting choices available to Singaporeans. The more we are able to offer a high quality public transport system and near car kind of services, whether it's car sharing, your P2Ps and so on, and if we can also make the first mile, last mile part of the commute a better one, then I think uh, people who choose to pay the sum that they pay, or the sums that they pay for to buy a car, will I think have reason to take a pause and reevaluate the choices that they make. But in the end, every individual is entitled to make their allocative decision. So we can't, but what we are really trying to do is make the alternatives as compelling as possible. And in fact, um, you hear this more from people who have lived overseas and come here. I was recently at an AmCham uh, dialogue, business dialogue, and one of the ladies said she came from the US where she was wholly reliant on her car, and she was waxing lyrical about our public transport system. And her teenage daughter, who studied here, used our public transport system, has since gone to, gone to the US for her further studies in Houston. Uh, according to her, the daughter laments that the public transport system in the U.S. is not of the same quality and accessibility as here. So we do have advocates, and, I've, and I'm very keen to get more such advocates, especially Singaporeans. And we do have. Many Singaporeans have told us that they really like the fact that we have a good public transport system. Of course, there are always areas we can improve. That's also why I cited the example, the survey. There is a perceptible shift in the preferences of younger generation of Singaporeans. They are more adept at using technology and some of the solutions already available. And as a result, they are less, uh, less seized with the need to buy a car. 
In fact, they think there are other ways of using their money. And I say good for them in that regard. Um, single to double-decker buses, I don't have the exact numbers, but I'll put it this way. The move for you know, sustainability is the thrust of the member's question. The main way we are seeking to ensure sustainability is through electrification. So our bus fleet, we have about 6,000 buses in the public bus fleet, and about half of these will be half of these will be electric by 2030. The other half will be a hybrid solution. So that's how we are moving. In terms of single and double decker, a lot of that is actually a function of uh, capacity planning based on the routes and the kind of demand. And this can vary depending on how uh, con commuter behavior changes over time. Um, would the minister consider alternative ways of allocating the vehicle quota uh, based on other factors instead of just price alone, like, for example, maybe a point-based system where, apart from the bidding price, we also consider other factors like um, nationality and needs-based factors like um, families with young children or uh, persons with disability? And secondly, uh, would the minister consider... Uh, in the same way as we have the additional buyer stamp duty for the purchase of a second or um, higher residential property, would the minister consider, consider additional levy on uh, additional vehicle purchase? Thank you. Member has raised a few questions. Let me try and deal with them. Uh, a points-based system. It is really a variation of the idea that Mr. Liang Inghua talked about, a ballot. Because in the end, you've got to decide what you would allocate the points on what basis. And how will that then factor into the final COE allocation? Does that mean that if someone has got more points, then they're entitled to a different price when it comes to their COE? Or does it mean that they go into a different pool? And if they go into a different pool, how do we segment the pools? So I think a points-based system has the same kind of in a sense, the, the kind of arbitrariness that we are trying to avoid. And we are trying to let the market work itself through. We do have schemes where we help people, for example, those who have special needs or persons with disability who need uh, vehicles for, uh, uh, for, say, work and so on. We do have schemes to help them with that, including with the COEs and so on. So those are very targeted measures that we can do. But that is best achieved not by tinkering with the COE allocation system, but by instead trying to defray some of the cost impact, if not all of the cost impact, on certain groups. It's not unlike what we do, for example, with electricity in Singapore. We price electricity fully. We don't subsidize it. We don't say first 100 units X, next 100 units Y, because we price them all the same, because everyone from the beginning is a, a unit of electricity. But then what we do is we provide use-save rebates, etc. So if we want to help certain categories of people, it's best to do it that way. Then the member makes a point about needs base. So the, and I'm quite sympathetic to this uh, point because many families say to me, look, I've got children uh, and I need to take them around to, um, you know, enrichment classes on the weekends, etc. And, you know, public transport doesn't quite work for me. And then we have others who say, look, I've got elderly parents whom I need to take to hospital or for appoint medical appointments, etc. I think if you look at households in Singapore that either have children or elderly parents they have to look after, that will probably cover most households in Singapore. So everyone has a need that I think we can understand the real question for us is do we have the resources and the capacity to meet that need effectively so that is where the challenge lies i mean i would be very happy if we had a cornucopia of coes that we can just dispense at will but we don't because of the constraints i've highlighted and that is why we have to make some tough choices in the allocative sense but having said that we are working on and in fact we do have some alternatives, as I've said, for persons with disability and so on, we've got certain targeted measures. Also, uh, car sharing services, because it allows households to have a car for a few hours, 
to do what they need to do and then come back and leave the car some, for somebody else to use. So that actually is a more efficient outcome and in fact it will save households a lot more money than buying a car and incurring the depreciation. So that is one of the things we, we are doing and we will do more. Also some of the point-to-point -point operators like um, Grab and so on, they offer um, chauffeured services for where you can do block booking by time. So for example, if you want to go take your parents to hospital, you think it'll take you four hours, half, whatever, you can make those sorts of bookings as well. So there are other solutions in place, and I would say that that is something we should keep in mind. And uh, as far as the idea of ABSD is concerned, well, I've already pointed out clearly that the COE price that we see today is not explained by multiple car owning households. They've actually been quite constant throughout. So actually, what, you know, so the, the question is, what is the problem we're trying to fix here? Because you may come up with a tool, it may, it may be a very popular move, but does it really address the problem at its root? I'd like to thank the Minister for sharing the statement earlier, uh, especially about the release of the five-year COEs. Uh, supply and all, also the measures taken by LTA over the past few months about the uh, deposits and all that. It has actually helped in terms of price discovery and microstructure. I've got two uh, clarifications, uh, Deputy Speaker. First is in, result, uh, in, in relation to our transition to move away and finding alternatives to uh, private car ownership. Um, I think Minister mentioned just now about enhancing the alternatives of private PTPs and PHC, PHCs and taxis, I think, going forward. My question is, as we still have Singaporeans aspiring to own cars and we are trying to go car light, I think these are the sort of issues that uh, I'm hearing from your statement. We are not moving away in, in any time soon. Car light, zero growth. Um, we are a very small country. And I think the push towards public transport, that's clear, uh, Minister. So the question is the transition. There is going to be a time transition as for people to move away from their aspirations. Uh, my question is, if you go to, towards a holistic approach or to car light strategy and zero growth, uh, how can we improve our PTP, PHC and taxi uh, services? Because the exasperation of Singaporeans on the ground, if they want to move a private car, but they want to wait for taxis and PHCs and it's not there, every single minute when they want to have access to 24 hours of the day at any time uh, is something that we need to be addressed. So that's, that's my first question. Um, and so the second question is, I, I'd like to get some clarification with regards to your five-year COEs uh, uh, supply uh, in terms of the numbers and what's your uh, direction of trends going forward beyond uh, the existential three to six months uh, this year and probably into many years ahead. Thanks, Minister. I thank the member for his uh Questions. May I, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, just to address one other point about ABSD that was raised. If the member's intent is that we should have progressivity in the COE system, actually we already have significant progressivity through the tax system, the ARF system that we have today, in terms of the cars and, and in fact, the finance minister announced a whole set of moves to further uh, and uh, increase the gradient and the progressivity. So I think those who are buying cars are actually going to be paying more, and especially if they're buying higher value cars or more expensive cars, they end up paying a higher amount in taxes as well. Um, on Mr. Sakdiandi's points, first is, can we do more to increase the supply of uh, the P2P, the private hire cars, and, and we use all these terms interchangeably and taxis and so on. The bottom line is we need to try all measures to enhance the availability of car light, car like, not car light, but car like services. Because what people really value is the flexibility to be able to hop into a car and go to multiple locations in a certain period of time and come back. But it's a waste to have the car sitting in the car park when you're not using it for hours, when you only need it maybe a few hours in a week. That's the crux of it. So we need to find more alternatives. And that's what uh, LTA and MOT are working on. Um, what we can do in terms of more of 
uh, in the P2P sector uh, and, and the PHCs. Uh, I, I have a smile on my face because uh, the member is asking for whether we can do more and have more PHCs. Uh, I think I've just heard from others advocating quite the opposite. So you understand the conundrum, I think. Uh, but the bottom line is, car for car, if I take a car away from private ownership and we put it in, a, in the P2P sector, it will benefit more people, at least as a first principle. Then there's all the sec, you know, issues we need to deal with in terms of policy. So uh, we are working on a whole range of ideas on this, how we can do more, and I accept the member's point that there is a transition. The transition is not just in terms of going to Carlite, but also because it will take us at least another, about 10 years more before our MRT system comes to that, that level where we really have uh, you know, good connectivity in many parts. We already have pretty good connectivity, by the way, but this will take it at least a notch higher. And we'll be well, you know, comparable to the best cities in the world. So the key thing is to manage the transition. And as I said, it's about populating the choice spectrum, giving people a whole range of options from public transport at one end to private car ownership on the other and everything in between. I think the more we can populate that choice spectrum and give people uh, you know, the information and the convenience to exercise that choice, I think then we are on the right path. Uh, on the five-year COE supply, I think the, the, the member's question is, uh, how will it be distributed, redistributed? And it's not just for one or two quarters, because what LTA and LTA will be releasing more information, essentially we've got five-year COEs that will expire uh, in the and probably in about three, four years' time, and that's when you're really going to, you know, if you look at the historical cycles, there's going to be sort of peakish. If you go on that everybody who is reaching the 10-year mark is going to deregister, then you're going to be at a peak. So that is where LTA is basically extracting the five-year COEs from, and it will be redeployed in the, in the not just this quarter or the next quarter, but in the next few quarters at least, leading up to this, because essentially, uh, it's as uh, one of my colleagues put it, a cut and fill exercise. You're really trying to smoothen the curve, try and avoid too sharp a gradient, and worse, the volatility, ups and downs. That's what we're trying to do. But I want to emphasize again, this is not about, therefore, expecting prices to ease, and that is a measure of success. The objective here is to smoothen the supply, reduce the volatility, so that people can then make their choices. And I put out the information, and I think car buyers as well as car dealers, based on that, they, I, I'm sure their behavior in the next and subsequent bidding rounds will be informed by this data. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I have two uh, clarifications. One is on uh, motorcycle COEs. I think the Minister will know I've spoken on this a uh, number of times, including on the 1st of March, where I asked for more measures to deter speculative uh, bidding. And I think what you mentioned about the main measures suggest that you do now recognize that uh, you know beyond supply and demand, uh, speculative behavior by dealers who have the incentives to bid up prices actually is a factor. Um, and especially so is amplified in a market where we're talking about a few hundred COEs uh, every month. Um, so I think we, and I think what sits with us is that we all feel that this is particularly egregious when um, the people who bear the brunt of uh, these actions by dealers are people who are, you know, the lowest income workers, um, the students who are holding part-time jobs because they need to. Um, and so I think, I guess my clarification is, uh, so can we do more to close down these loopholes um, a bit faster? How, how can we be more responsive? Um, one suggestion could be, I mean, 200, 800, 1500 is a bit arbitrary. Um, could we tie the dealer deposits to the size of their bids um, to be a, a bit more quicker to, um, to you know, rein in uh, speculative bidding? Two, could we allow for individuals to bid 
uh, like we have in cars uh, for motorcycles also. Um, and three, is there a way to provide more transparency on uh, individual dealer bidding practices? Uh, my second clarification on um, on uh, car COEs this time. Uh, Minister mentioned that uh, you know you're currently still studying the impact of uh, COEs of PHCs on um, on uh, COE prices, um, and so I wanted to just clarify: Is there no evidence? Do you feel that there's no evidence today that uh, PHCs are driving up um, COE prices, or are there actually? I mean, it's, the market works, but it is also not a level playing field, as we know. Uh, they have ways to pass on higher prices and also, um, you know, the ability to convert some of these PHCs into uh, private cars, um, although, of course, that, there's a market for that. Um, so can we, how can we close down some of these loopholes? Do they actually exist today? How many cars are converted from PHCs to private cars? Uh, by this platform companies as an option, and can that be closed down as a low-hanging fruit? Thank you. I thank the member for her questions. Um, first, I, I want to just be very clear. The member suggests that the moves we make uh, affirm or confirm that there has been speculative behaviour and that's what's causing uh, the prices to go up. That's not quite what I said, so let me just repeat that clearly. The fact is, the market has already been functioning, and the way we know that is when the price goes up, as it did in some of the earlier cycles, when the COE price for motorcycles went up to $13,000, and subsequently it came down, the market corrected. And how did it correct? Well, those who were left with very expensive COEs realized that they can't sell the motorcycles with those COEs, and they then had to give up. The, the COEs or they forfeited them. And we then have to recycle that into the market. Now, what happens then is, just to be very clear, before we made the latest moves, such as the uh, reduction of the validity period, was that the supply that is forfeited cannot be returned to the market until the next quarter. So there's a lag of at least, you know, 10 to 12 weeks before it goes back. And what we wanted to do was to re-channel quicker, so we shortened the bid period, and you know, then the, the, the motorcycle dealers can decide what they want. And similarly, um, I don't think the, whether it's $800 or $1,500, they are not arbitrary. I beg to differ with the member. Uh, if you take $1,500, for example, it is something like, well, at least before this uh, recent correction, which may or may not be sustained, but it is about 10% or so. And it is of a similar order of magnitude to what uh, we have for cars as well, COEs for cars. So there's a certain method in it. Why we exercise restraint and caution in raising the bid deposit? Simply because precisely what the member says. If we inadvertently, through our policy moves, because deposits are very high, cause motorcycle prices to rise even further, then it will harm precisely the group that the member wants to help. And that's why we've been cautious about the way we've done this. Um, it may not be as fast as some would have liked, but I think the yoke of being in government and in LTA and MOT is that you have to exercise judgment and decide not just what to do, but also how much and when. And this is what has you know, eventuated in what we are doing now. now can there be individual bids? The answer is yes, there can be, but the market practice in general is that peop the uh, motorcycle buyers have a preference to just be able to go in and buy off the, you know, in the shops. And this is why we've had this uh, arrangements uh, for motorcycle dealers. But there's nothing really that we, you know, we can accommodate this, and we, in fact we do already. On PHCs, uh, is there evidence of, or is there no evidence of PHCs driving up prices? Well, I, I'd like to draw the members' attention to what I said in my ministerial statement. Basically, um, in a period, for example, 2015 to 2017, when the PHC population grew from 30,000 to 70,000, which is, or nearly 70,000, so doubling, there was the impact on COE prices was not particularly discernible. 
at least I don't recall it, I wasn't in MOT, but there was not a lot of uh, questions about it. By the same token and conversely, over the last several quarters and years, uh, COE prices have been rising, but actually PHC demand, as I said, or PHC's uh, number of uh, COEs they've secured, has actually been moderating. So I don't think you can make an argument ex ante that there is a causality and, and this. So I understand that we are unhappy with, you know, when prices go up. But uh, let's not be too quick to conclude what the causes are and, you know, and, and therefore start fixing problems that may not really be the, at the root of the issue. But having said that, I concede the point to the member on the, the fact is, it is a new, and that's why I said what I said in my statement. PHCs are, are a relatively new phenomenon, and it's a very variegated terrain. You have, um, you know, it's not just your grabs, you've got your car sharing guys, you've got the rental guys who, who lend lease to the drivers and so on. So there's a whole variety. And so it's important that we understand this correctly before we decide whether there is a need to act because they have an impact that perhaps distorts the market, and then if so, then what are those targeted measures? And that's what the Ministry of Transport and, and LTA are studying. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I have some quick clarifications pertaining to public transport. In the new fare adjustment formula, how is the productivity contribution quantum of 0.1% derived? Are these all the productivity gains that MOT is expecting the PTOs to achieve, and could that be too low an expectation? Secondly, how closely, and related to that, how closely does LTA work with the PTOs to conceive and implement productivity enhancing measures, and how can LTA be sure that the PTOs don't treat the 0.1% productivity contribution as a cost of doing business without any significant, without significant productivity gains that will reduce, reduce costs over the long term and help to stave off future fare hikes. And lastly, when PTOs rationalize bus services, for example, the removal of bus services 22, 66, and 506 for my residents in Bodok Reservoir in 2021, sorry, I'm not letting go of this, which saves the, which saves the government $9.5 million a year in subsidies. How are these cost savings passed to commuters? Thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for his persistence and perseverance. Um, let me try and deal with the issues in turn. First, the formula. Um, I think it's important to understand 0.1%, it's not, you see, it's a productivity uh, contribution, but it is a deduction from the fare increase. So leaving aside, for example, the recent periods when it's 12% or whatever it was, and so on, 13% and so on, if you look at, in general, let's say you have a year when the fare increase is 2%. When I extract 0.1% from you, every one, you know, if it's 1%, I'm extracting 10% from you. 2% is 5, right? If it's a 3% increase, it's 0 .3 and so on. So actually, it's quite a sizable 3%, sorry, 3.3. So it's actually quite a sizable imposition on the PTOs. It's not a, a free pass by any means. Your point about whether we should, uh, uh, whether we are doing more to work with them on productivity enhancement, absolutely. I think this is an important thing. It's a win-win. Uh, it's not something where, you know, we want LTA, you know, to just dictate and be left with. It. We see this as a joint uh, endeavor, and that's why many of the moves that are being made, uh, you know, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, fuel efficiencies, et cetera. These are all areas that we're working together with the PTOs on. Um, and I think your point on rationalizing bus services um, and when there are savings, how does it get passed through to uh, commuters? So if I may, uh, like the member, persevere and persist with my counterpoints. The fact is we are subsidizing bus services a billion dollars a year. We're not recovering costs by any stretch. So any savings are plowed back into the system and it just gets distributed at large. But the bottom line is we are subsidizing public transport significantly. 
a billion dollars for bus, a billion dollars for train, or if you want to think about it another way, every journey gets a $1 subsidy. That's not counting those who are on concession passes and those who are buying the concession fares, uh, those who get concession fares and also the concession passes. So I think we, you know, by all accounts, and I think being very objective, we are, I think, making a strong effort to ensure that our public transport system remains affordable. And if you look, look at international comparisons, the answer is we are. And if you look at our own pattern over time, expenditure on public transport as a percentage of household expenses, actually over the last 10 years, it's been declining. For the quintile, for the, uh, for the decile, you know, almost all the key metrics that we look at. So my point is, we will continue to do our best to keep public transport affordable. There's a significant amount of subsidy. When we get savings, it basically is plowed back into the system. We can't do it at the particular service level. It has to be at a you know aggregated level. But in the end, the the what really has an impact on the final expenditure incurred by the commuter is the subsidy that the government gives, and that is not insubstantial. I thank the Minister for a very clear explanation on a difficult and emotive topic. I have a few clarifications on this um, five-year COE being brought forward. The first is, is this just um, one-off to deal with the current trough, or is this going to be a change in approach to how the five-year COEs are dealt with? Uh, the second is, um, I believe the Minister said they'd be reallocated to Cat A. I just want to clarify, would they be reallocated according to the expiring category, or would they all be reallocated only to Cat A? Um, and I think, yeah. Uh, the third is I just wish to make the point that I think it is sensible to smooth out the supply over the long term. And any measures to help do that, I think, would be a fair. Thank you. I thank the member for agreeing with us that this effort to smoothen supply is something that is appropriate. Um, it is a one-off exercise. And specifically, because it's a five-year COE, the time horizon is five years. I won't know or LTE won't know how many five-year COEs will be expiring more than five years from now, right? Because So therefore, basically what we know is the projection from now to five years from now, and the latter part of that period coincides with the peak in the 10-year cycle. It's a very well-defined quantum because we have to bear in mind that the rest of the supply, which is dependent on deregistration, is really variable because it depends on whether people choose to deregister and therefore buy a new, uh, contribute back into the supply, or they may decide they want to renew their COEs. We don't know what will happen, and that will then depress. So the only component that we can deal with with certainty is the five-year COE, and that certainty is only available on a five-year outlook basis, and that's why we are doing this as a one-off, because it also serves a very important purpose of smoothening the supply from now, especially because now we are more or less in the trough of the 10-year cycle. So it is a good time to look at how we can do some smoothening, and this is the reason we are looking, uh, adopting this. And yes, the supply will go back to the relevant category. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Just two questions for the Minister of Transport, and they are quite narrow, uh, relating to the volatility or, pre or trying to manage a vol volatility in COE prices. So the first question is uh, with regard to uh, car loan restrictions, which are now at seven years and at 70% uh, of the selling price. Uh, is the Ministry intending to look at the loopholes vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, these car loan curbs, because it's not uncommon to hear of 100% uh, companies offering 100% or dealerships offering 100% uh, loans and things of that nature. That's the first question. The second question pertains to the continuing, uh, the second question pertains to the continuing relevance of the Cat E COE, the open category. Uh, unlike Cat A and Cat B, which we know are tied to um, car registration numbers, uh, the Cat E COE is uh, uh, 
uh, can be traded, I think for up to three months, if I recall correctly. And so there is a potential speculative vector in CAT ECOEs. And would it, uh, I, I would like to know what is uh, the Ministry of Transport's view on the continued relevance and uh, of, of CAT E COEs and whether actually removing that category altogether uh, can help for a, a more smoother COE system. Thank you. Um, just uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and to the Leader of the Opposition. Just to be very clear, uh, we are not talking about volatility in prices. That's not the objective of the exercise, it's volatility in supply. How prices eventuate in the market is a function, as I've discussed and all of us know, function of various factors that are taking place. And today the prices may go down, tomorrow they may go up. We think that the long the long term trajectory is upwards for the reasons I've mentioned. Our supply is basically zero growth, so it's capped. And the demand is a function, among other things, of incomes, and incomes are rising. So we must be prepared for this. So if every time COE prices go up, we approach it as some kind of new phenomenon, I think we should take pause and understand that these are the fundamentals that we are dealing with. It's a hard choice we have to make. And the decision to have zero vehicle growth rate is a very hard choice. But what is the alternative? So I just want to be very clear, it is not about price volatility, although that I know is a, a political concern, it is about supply volatility and how much we can smoothen that so that the market can function. That's the key thing. Um, on the point on curbs on car loans, I think this should be a question answered by MAS. Was there a PQ on this already? There was today? Oh. Um, maybe I'll allow my colleague uh, Alvin to repeat, but let me just say this. Uh, it's, loans are under the purview of MAS, and if it's higher purchase, then I think it's uh, you know, under MTI. But the key point I want to make is the moves we are making from the MOT perspective and LTA is really in order to ensure the market functions as we intended and to smoothen the supply. And that's why we are going for this. Your second question on the relevance of CAT-E, first we need to size the thing correctly. CAT-E has 10% only of CAT-A and CAT-B, 10% goes into CAT-E, all right? So why do we do that? Essentially, when you have a system which has got, and we've had basically a CAT-E component from the very beginning. And why is that important? Because you do need a mechanism when you've got these very fixed categories, you need a mechanism, a valve, if you will, that can help redistribute some. Because preferences may change over time. There may be a greater shift towards Cat A, there may be a greater shift to bigger cars, there may be you know, other kinds of movements we don't know. So this really creates a valve in the system. It is a valve that we have actually been progressively uh, throttling down in fact, uh, in the early days, it was much more, the contribution from the different categories, and today it's 10%. So it's at a level we, we, of course, as I've said, with COEs and the system, the government has always been reviewing and, and constantly evaluating the relevance of measures. But I'm just trying to give the context for the leader of the opposition's benefit. So it, is, it serves an important purpose. Um, I don't think it is a purpose that is uh, irrelevant uh, in today's context by any means and I, for the foreseeable future. But, you know, if there are some other uh, efforts to think about the design of the system, then at that point maybe this can be revisited. So then I think, um, yeah, so the reason why, you can't say I create a valve, but then I restrict its usage. That's why you need the flexibility. In terms, if you can't trade it then, uh, and, and apply it to different categories and give them enough time to do that, then it, it, you may as well not have the category. So the design and the features are tied specifically to the intent behind having the category. Um, I think, Alvin, would you like to? Yeah. MOS Alvin Tan, if you would like to contribute to so the just, just, um, debate. Uh, just to build on Minister's point, uh, there is a PQ uh, by Ms. Mariam Jaffa that's on today's order paper, uh, 64 on the order paper. 
Uh, so MES will I'll respond to MES and uh, using that PQ. But primarily, MES restrictions on uh, loans that are granted by financial institutions are to encourage borrowers to spend or to borrow prudently. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the very comprehensive reply. Uh, I, I have the two supplementary questions on the CAT E C O E. Uh, as what Minister has said, CAT E C O E. As what Minister has said, so, you know, uh, the contribution of CAT E C O E is from 10% of CAT A B C D registered go to E. And uh, I want to ask, uh, Minister, why do we want to contribute from C, where it is mainly used for commercial vehicles and all the category E, C, O, E are mainly to register CAT B, C, O, E, which means that you are shrinking the CAT C, C, O, E meant for commercial vehicles. Uh, the second separate question is that uh, um, I'm very thankful the Minister is uh, using the next five years, five years C, O, E, aspiring next five years to redistribute earlier in the next few quarters. And the uh, Minister had just said that it will go back to the respective category. So uh, I would like the urge minister to really distribute more to the CAT ACOE because it's a mass market COE, uh, as well as the CAT ECOE always mirror and always registered for CAT BCOE. Thank you. I thank uh, the member for his uh, suggestions. Um, first, why uh, does CAT C also contribute to CAT E? Well, because CAT E can also be used for CAT C. But that Today, uh, it is not the case. doesn't mean tomorrow it won't be the case. That's why I'm saying that what we have to bear in mind is that the market has its own dynamic. We don't know how things will go. People may decide that they don't like cars, they don't want cars, and there may be a need more for commercial vehicles, in which case your Cat E will end up being used for Cat C. Or people may shift their preferences to smaller cars because they want to be more uh, you know, environmentally conscious or spend less and so on, and then your cat E could potentially go in there. And in fact, uh, you know, we do see some of those sorts of behavior. So the point is, um, you know, you must take from the categories to which the, 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 the cat E can apply, and that's why we do this. So for motorcycles, for example, we don't do that. And the reason is, you know, this was uh, some years back, and the reason is because you don't, and you don't allow cat E's to be used for motorcycles. So that sort of takes the motorcycles out of it. But for all the other vehicles, they're in the same cat class, and we put them in, uh, in that uh, contribution group. Um, can we do more? <laughs> this is already a big move, you know. Taking five year COEs that are expiring in the future, and bringing them to the present. That's a one big move. It's a necessary move, and we think it will have a salutary impact overall in the system. So that's why we're doing it. But we just want to have a situation where we don't make too many arbitrary kind of decisions. So in response to Mr. Vikram Nair's question earlier, I said that we will reallocate on this basis uh, that you know, cat A will come back to cat A, cat B to cat B. And uh, based on the numbers and what we can see, it should meet the objective of smoothening supply. There's no need for cross deployment. And as I said in, earlier in my ministerial statement, uh, for, this, for the, big bidding, the bidding quarter we are in now, it will increase supply by 24%. I think that's quite substantial. And cat B, in fact, the five-year COEs that are available for CAT B are a lot less, and that's why also consequently you see a much lower percentage increase of about 15%. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I have two questions for the uh, Minister. One is, um, the whole uh, um, discussion here actually is about prices going too fast, too high, and also about equity. When the prices go up high, you know, uh, many Singaporeans will not be able to afford. So one of the uh, uh, grievances that I've also heard from uh, from some residents is that the Cat A and the Cat B, a lot of the expensive cars are now going down to Cat A. So as a result, in order to ensure more equity among Singaporeans, the lower income can still buy uh, cars, you know, the cheaper cars, would you consider putting OMV as an additional criteria for classifying Cat A? That's one question. Second question is that um, for the uh, recent uh, uh, phenomena we've seen in the uh, motorcycle market, it has indicated that the government do have some leverage on 
controlling the prices in the motorcycle COE market. And with the recent collapse, I think it's a reflection that uh, not enough has been done in the past. So going forward, would the uh, uh, minister uh, say that uh, the government would be more careful? To, because the price of the most motorcycle is very important for many of our working uh, Singaporeans. We'll be more careful in maybe controlling the prices of the uh, motorcycle COE. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your indulgence, can I just understand, so uh, does, the member, is, does the member think that uh, lowering of the price is good or bad? I mean, I'm trying to understand. When you say be more careful, what do you mean? Uh, Minister, lowering is good. I will prefer to have a lower price, yeah. So if I may just ask one other question while you're at the uh, lectern. The, does the member agree, because I, made, uh, I took considerable pains to explain this, does the member agree that if supply is limited, in fact capped at zero growth, and incomes are rising, that the almost unavoidable conclusion is that the prices must rise? Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, to answer the, uh, the Minister, yes, we, we agree to all the things that, uh, to many of the things that the Minister have said. For example, we have to control car population. As a result, we require the COE system uh, to, to uh, allocate, you know. But they allocate the COEs, limited supply. But however, I think the government should also be careful when prices go up too fast, there will be problem. Problem from the uh, uh, aspect of affordability and also from the aspects of equity. So as a result, I think actually what the discussion today is actually about that. You know, prices have gone up too much, like the motor motorcycle COE has gone up multiple times over the last two years. So we prefer lower price. Yeah. Got it. So, you know, we all prefer lower prices, Mr. Leong. I think that let's be very clear about that. We all want to help the people who buy cars and motorbikes. I don't think you have a monopoly of virtue in that regard. I think the real question here is, and I think you have, and if I hear you correctly, you accept that the long-term trend in prices must be up. So now your point is more about the rate of change and, and whether that can be something can be done. So perhaps if I can take uh, the member's second question first. We do not control prices. I think I want to put that categorically on the table because we are not stipulating the price or even a range. The only thing that the government is able to do is settle on the supply and if there are any mechanics in the system, whether there are reasons to adjust them. That is what we've been doing. How that flows into the market or works through the market is also dependent on demand, as you would know, and finally the price outcome is how the market settles it. We know that the CAT D price has come down, but does this mean that this is the new level? I think even if you listen to the industry players, they would advocate that uh, we watch this for a while because whether it's buyers or dealers, they all have to sort of assess the situation and the market will have to find a new equilibrium. Where that is, I can't say. But what I can say with certainty is that the long term, we will, have to see, we will see upward price pressure for the fundamental realities we've discussed. So we do not control prices, so please do not advocate that. Secondly, uh, Mr. Ong, makes this political point about high COE prices mean many Singaporeans cannot afford. So the subtext is, is somehow it's foreigners who are buying it. Because if Singaporeans can't afford it, who's buying it? So that's your implication. And I want you to be upfront about it because I have taken pains to point out again that the proportion of foreigners buying cars has remained low and stable. So yes, what is happening is actually, and the correct characterization may well be that when the COE price goes up, some people will find it more difficult to afford, other people may find it easier to afford. So there's a reallocation and distribution going on within our society. And that is one of the things, it's a politically uncomfortable thing, but it's a reality. 
And I would urge the member to be careful in the way you make this point, because otherwise, you know, we create wrong, we, we, we give wrong conclusions and we end up distorting the discussion. But having said that, I think, as I've, you, you, do you want to respond to this specifically? Please I do I think so. you can carry on, yeah, Minister. Thank you. So the other point that the member makes is on OMV and whether OMV should be used as a basis for uh, categories. He, I had addressed the member's point in my ministerial statement. The median OMV for Cat B is about 70, 75% more than the median OMV for Cat A. That means it is actually the market is already quite separated, right? Because up to 75% here, I mean, you know, you have the, the separation in terms of value. The next thing is we've achieved this, or this is the outcome, but the criteria we are using are objective criteria, engine capacity, power output, what I've described earlier. And our objective has always been to make sure that these criteria are able to accommodate the mass market models in the Cat A as far as possible. That was one of the reasons for the recent adjustment so that the electric, uh, the mass market electric vehicle models could also be uh, in cap captured. But is there going to be some movement on the margin? Yes. So you will see, for example, yes, there are some, um, as you uh, put it, some of the uh, more expensive type cars migrating to the Cat A. But by the same token, we also have uh, what are considered generally as um, uh, mass market cars that are actually in Cat B. Example would be some of the SUVs, like I think it's a Subaru, Imbrezia, and, uh, and a Mitsubishi, something or other. They are actually, because of their engine capacity, two liter, they are in Cat B. So what I'm trying to say is, it is not a clean cut. And the problem with using an OMV, amongst other things, is that the OMV is not something that is an uh, objective criteria because there are a lot of other variables. For example, if exchange rates move, the OMV of the car changes, right? So how would you account for that? So I think when we are making these recommendations, let's keep this in mind that there are many moving parts. But the fundamental objective, which is the point that I think you're also driving at, we want to ensure that there's an element of progressivity in our COE system. And that's why we have two categories. And as I said in my ministerial statement, we will continue to look at this. And if there's a need to adjust the criteria that divides the two categories, we will look at it. But as of now, there's no compelling reason and certainly not uh, to use the OMV. Mr. Leung, insofar as you are going to respond to the minister's question to you, you are allowed to do so. And then we'll end with the last hand, which I see, which is Mr. Pitam Singh. And then we will move on. So if you'd like to respond to the minister, no clarifications, please, just uh, your answer to yes, the minister. Yes, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Yeah, I'd like to respond to the minister's point about uh, whether I'm uh, uh, pinpointing uh, foreigners uh, uh, crowding out uh, the Singaporeans in the market. Uh, in this instance, uh, about this COE, no. My question is about the equity among Singaporeans. You, know? you mentioned that COE uh, prices for the, uh, CAT, uh, uh, the, uh, the OMV value for CAT A uh, and cap, between CAT A and CAT B is only, uh, uh, there's a 75% difference. Okay? But actually that may not capture the whole picture. So anyway, we are just uh, 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 urge the government to further consider so that uh, under the CAT A, the, lower in, the slightly lower income Singaporeans can still afford the cheaper cars. Okay, thank you very much. Minister, do you want to respond or? Very well. Uh, after Mr. Pritam Singh is your, pr Mr. Mr. Pritam Singh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Just a quick uh, point in response to uh, the remark made by Minister of State, uh, Mr. Alvin Tan, vis-a-vis -vis Member uh, Mariam Jaffa's uh, written PQ for today's order paper. Um, it is directed to the Prime Minister and specifically to MAS on uh, 
curbs on car loans. So as we know, and as Minister has alluded, you know, you also have uh, car loans which uh, take the form of um, almost like money lending or quasi money lending arrangements. You have higher purchase which comes under MTI. So just to confirm whether this would be a whole of government exercise to look at car loans uh, or vehicle loans, including even motorcycle loans, and uh, whether any uh, there is any prospect of a review to ensure that the loopholes uh, with regard to the financing of vehicles can be uh, further looked at and even tightened if need be. Thank you. Speak, uh, Deputy Speaker, short answer is uh, MAS will work with MOT to monitor the situation in the COE market. Thank you. Minister Swaran, if you can close the yes. business on this uh, subject. Yes. Um, so I... Uh, so I thank uh, Mr. Leong to clarify, for clarifying that uh, he is not making the argument that foreigners are depriving Singaporeans uh, of cars, uh, because he has been known to make that argument in other contexts. So I wanted to be very sure about it. It's okay; you don't need to pursue, pursue the matter. But having said that, I just want to thank all members for, uh, you know, a very vigorous uh, clarification session. But the objective. If I may restate with your indulgence, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we need to make sure that all of us in this House and Singaporeans in general understand the fundamental constraints that we are dealing with. We can't run away from them. And those constraints around land, around carbon emissions, and what we need to do is something that we will have to grapple with. Previous transport ministers have had to do this. I'm doing it. Future transport ministers will have to do this. But in the end, they need this house and the broader support of this house to support and also the broader society. Because if we don't internalize this constraint, then we are always going to be unhappy with the outcome. What we do need to do, though, is then work on all the other options and solutions so that we can make the public tra the transport system in Singapore, not just car light, but as I have said, accessible and inclusive and sustainable. Thank you very much.